Hello, good evening. This is Lisbeth Shaw Tabon. I'm a medical doctor in the Philippines. But here I'm trying to um, spread or help spread in about Jesus, most especially the Holy Trinity. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit that uh, in times of trouble, times of trials, it's a good thing. It's, it's also very healthy to think that you're not by yourself, that there is a God who loves you and would like to help you, guide you. But of course, we have to be patient and we also have to listen and obey their prompting. because they know us very well, they know our future, and they know what's best for us so that we are kept healthy spiritually, mentally, and physically. All we do is really keep on asking them, keep on nagging them, you know, keep on talking to them, you know, because uh, that's the only way that's the best. Now, today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Luke 4. It's the Bible verse I opened yesterday. I have a day backlog. <laughs> But it's fine, you know. Usually, it's a message for me, and or some, it's a it's a message that the Holy Spirit want me to share. But before I do that, let me pray to the Holy Spirit so that we'll be guided. Dear Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill my heart with your holy gifts. Let my witness be penetrated with thy strength this very day, that I may fulfill all the duties of my state, consciously that I may do what is right and just. Let my charity be such as to offend no one, hurt no one's feelings, so generous to pardon sincerely and wrong done to me. Assist me, O Holy Spirit, in all the trials of life. Enlighten me in my ignorance. Advise me in my doubt. Strengthen me in my weakness. Help me in all need and embarrassment. Protect me in temptations. And console me in afflictions. Graciously hear me, O Holy Spirit, and pour thy light into my heart, my soul, and my mind. Assist me to live a holy life, to grow in goodness and grace. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, with thy light, with thy grace, with thy strength, with thy consolation, with thy charity, that I may be made worth to live a life of holy love. Amen. Let's watch some, you know, the, the uh, watch and read the look for, and also some of other pastors' uh, overview of this chapter. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place, 
and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ah, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all, and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, 
Demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now and listen to some overview. Hi everyone, let's talk about Luke chapter 4 in 5 minutes. If you want this free handout, you can get it at the link down below on our website. When do the events of chapter 4 take place? They really pick up right at the end of chapter 3. The narrative in chapter 3 ends with Jesus' baptism, and now Jesus is going out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And just like last chapter, this is approximately 30 AD. We have some old and new characters in this chapter. First of all, there's Jesus. He's the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of Mary. We also have his arch nemesis in this chapter, Satan or the devil, who is always going around trying to tempt people to sin. The citizens of Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, are also going to make an appearance. And there's a man with an unclean spirit who Jesus is going to meet in the synagogue. And then the other main characters are Simon, also known as Peter, one of Jesus' twelve apostles, and his mother-in-law, who Jesus is going to heal from a fever. And then, as we've been doing, we talk about where the events of this chapter took place. If you have the handout, there's a map on there that highlights all of these areas, but there's two regions that are mentioned specifically, the region of Galilee and the region of Judea, and then three locations specifically within those regions. The wilderness of Judea is where the chapter really opens, and then Jesus goes to Nazareth and then to the city of Capernaum. Let's go over a quick overview of the chapter now. The first 15 verses, as we talked about, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. So after his baptism, Jesus goes to the wilderness and Satan is there. And the text says that for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Luke records three specific temptations that Jesus went through during this time. The first one, Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones to, to uh, bread. The second one was Satan coming to Jesus and telling him to fall down and worship him. And he would give him all the kingdoms of the earth. And then the third one, Satan questioned Jesus' deity that he was the son of God. And so he takes him up to the temple. He says, throw yourself down. And if you're really the son of God, the angels will come and save you. Well, Jesus refuses to give in to any of these temptations. He rejects the devil and the, dev the devil departs and leaves him. And then Jesus really begins his ministry. And he goes throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And in the next 15 verses, verses 16 through 30, Jesus' teaching is rejected in Nazareth. So Jesus goes back to his hometown, Nazareth, and he starts teaching in their synagogues on the Sabbath day. And he starts telling them that he is the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, that the day has come and, and he's the guy. But because of the familiarity that the people there had with Jesus, they thought, no, no way, no way this guy's the Messiah. They didn't believe him. Jesus rebuked them for not believing, and they got really angry at him, and they actually wanted to kill him. They took him, and they intended to throw him off this tall tower, and, but Jesus miraculously made an escape. In the next chunk, verses 31 through 37, Jesus heals a man who had an unclean spirit. He left Nazareth, and then he went to the city of Capernaum, and there he went to the synagogue. And there was a man who was possessed by an unclean spirit, or an evil spirit, or a demon. He called the man to him, and he healed the man. He, he cast out the demon. And the people who were there, they were really astonished. They responded very differently than the people in Nazareth. They were astonished at his words and at his power, and they went and told everybody in the region about Jesus. And then in the final section, verses 38 through 44, Jesus heals a lot of sick people, and he goes around the region preaching the gospel. Jesus left the synagogue where he cast out the unclean spirit, and he goes to Simon's house, also known as Peter, one of the twelve apostles. His mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Jesus healed her. And then the word of these healings was getting around, so all kinds of people were coming to Simon's house and asking Jesus to heal their relatives and their friends, and he did that that evening and that night. In the morning, then, the people really wanted Jesus to stay in Capernaum and continue doing his miracles, but he told them that he couldn't because he had to go out and preach the, quote, good news of the kingdom of God in other towns. So what kind of big picture takeaways can I get from this chapter? Well, in the first part of the chapter, Jesus' temptations, it shows us that Jesus faced temptations just like us. 
and he can sympathize with our struggles and our difficulty in battling the devil and battling sin. Sometimes it's easy to be tempted to think that God is very distant from us. He doesn't know what it's like to be us, but that's actually not true. God knows what it's like to be human, and that's a really important point in the grand scheme of things. When we think about applications, Jesus' time in Nazareth, it didn't go very well, and the people were angry at him, and that brings up the application that sometimes it's the people that we know the best that are hardest to reach with the gospel. Relatives, friends that we've known for a long time, sometimes it's really hard to teach them what we've come to discover. Jesus' experience wasn't any different. Then for a second application, sometimes the greatest truths come from the most common or unexpected places. The people of Nazareth evidently couldn't, couldn't even believe that the Messiah had grown up in their hometown. And because Jesus was so familiar to them, they just kind of rejected what he had to say. We always need to be on the lookout for truth no matter where it comes from. Four signs that show we are walking in the Spirit. After giving your lives to Christ and confessing Him as our Lord and Savior, our Christian journey begins. A lot of people have the misconception that is end, but it really isn't. It's only the beginning of many spectacular changes that will take place in the time to come as we continue on this eternal path. As we grow in our journey with Christ as a believer, there are visible signs and changes that confirm our growth in Christ and tell whether we are on the right path or not. As a child, my father used to always tell me, growth is a principle. If something is not growing, there is a problem. I believe this to be absolutely true in the spiritual sense. Luke 2 verse 52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Now in the Bible we see this wonderful term, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To walk by the Spirit, you first need to receive the Spirit. The Spirit we are talking about here is the Holy Spirit. He is the helper for Christians who want real results in their Christian walk. The Holy Spirit comes with a wonderful range of benefits to the believer. He gives us power to overcome the challenges of life, to bear the greatest burdens and adversity. This is why you find saints who are filled with the Holy Spirit still have joy during the sorrows of life. He is also a guide. He will guide into all truth. He knows the way Jesus opened when he was on earth, the way which leads you away from everything harmful and negative and toward what blesses and benefits your neighbor, filling you with joy and peace. Therefore, to live a life in the Spirit, a life that walks in the Spirit and not the flesh, is a life centered around the Holy Spirit. Here are four signs that show that we are walking in the Spirit. Firstly, an individual begins to deliberately chase after Christ and the things of the Spirit. Growth is intentional, not accidental. Just as we are conscious about our physical growth, nurture our bodies and keep it healthy, so it is when it concerns the Spirit. There has to be a conscious effort of abiding in Christ, the determination to follow His commandments and do whatever He asks. 1 John 3 verse 24 now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Chasing after Christ isn't necessarily about doing activities or busy working for him, as many of us have termed it to mean. Although our service and willingness to do God's work or be an instrument in his service is also a further confirmation that we love him, but that isn't all there is to it. We need to make sure that we keep his commands and maintain our connection through prayer, trust and constant yielding and brokenness in spirit. It's not about working for him, it's also about letting him work in us too. Secondly, our gaze is not fixated on fleshly desires. The more we journey with God and walk in the spirit, the more we see the desires to gratify the desires of the flesh die and fade away. This isn't because of our own willpower, but because of the spirit of God that's at work in us. Galatians 5 verse 16 to 17 So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh.
for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit likes what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Apostle Paul pointed out to us in this verse that it's not by our power that the natural man gives way to Christ, but by abiding and walking in the spirit. When we find out that the mundane things that normally get us attracted, excited or distracted, no longer please us or tickle our fancy, it's a good sign that God's Spirit is mightily at work in us. When we no longer yield to the yearnings of the flesh, and all our priorities are things that pertain to the knowledge of God, we can be said to be walking in the Spirit. Thirdly, another sign is that yielding to the things of the Spirit comes easily for you. Walking in the Spirit makes keeping the laws and commands of God easier. If at every point in our Christian journey we struggle to obey God's instructions, or find it difficult to follow God's leading our struggle surrender to God's will rather than our own, then it might be that we haven't surrendered to Him fully and let Him have His way in us. We won't dilly-dally or wait to be dragged before expressing our love for Him if His Spirit is at work in us. To walk in the Spirit also makes us overcome all kinds of temptations that might appear in our lives, even when our fellow humans tempt us and are incited to retaliate or react in a very unpleasant way. We hold our peace and resolve the situation amicably, without escalating. Romans 12 verse 21 Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This will be our anchor scripture. When we are faced with situations that will ordinarily make us react in a retaliative or destructive way. Fourthly and finally, we are producing good fruits. The fruits we produce indicate whether we are truly walking in the Spirit or just trying to keep up appearances. The book of Galatians 5 verse 19 to 26 clearly states that the acts of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22 to 26 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 23. A gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. 24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When we see these fruits manifest in our lives and are our default resolve to handle and approach any situation that we are going through in life, it shows that we are yielding and giving in to the work of Christ in us. As we continue to yield, these fruits become more pronounced in our lives. We will be continuously transformed so we think and act differently from who and what we used to be. As much as growth is intentional, it's also not a day's job. Nobody grows into being an adult in one day. In our Christian journey, especially as young Christians, sometimes we might lose our trail or digress from the road. We should not lose hope or courage or think God is no longer interested in us or that the journey has become useless because of that one mistake or multiple mistakes. We should find the boldness and comfort we need in Christ and continue. Another for the Spirit is the Comforter. He will comfort us hold our hands and lead us through the journey. We must not get to any point in our Christian journey when we think we are independent of the Spirit or are knowledgeable enough to walk our own walk. The walk with the Spirit is a perpetual one. We should continuously seek the Spirit's help to stay on track and get the strength needed to finish our course a victor. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Romans 8 verse 26 The Holy Spirit is the evidence that God lives in us. He is God's gift to us to help walk through life. He is the guarantee that we belong to God. That means He is a seal of ownership. Romans 8.16 and Ephesians 1.13-14 through 14 explains this. A car cannot function without fuel. In the same way, the believer is powerless without the Holy Spirit. It is in Him that we find our strength. Reliance on our physical strength will lead to frustration. 
This is why Jesus asked the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. The Father recognized that we need a support system as we sojourn through the earth. Hence, He sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, guide, and comforter. John 16, 7 through 15, the disciples received boldness and started demonstrating power after the Holy Spirit came upon them. To live without the consciousness of the Holy Spirit as a believer is to live as a natural man, powerless, vulnerable, and unable to fulfill God's mandate. A believer without the Holy Spirit cannot even access his new identity in Christ Jesus. He'll still be cheated by the enemy because of his ignorance. 1 Corinthians 2.12 tells us that what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot walk in the reality of our redemption power, and other privileges we have in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is our helper. John 15, 26, a friend you can completely rely on. He strengthens us in our weaknesses. He helps us to communicate freely with the Father. Romans 8, 26, without him, the Christian faith will be exhausting. It's a spiritual business, and as such, you need spiritual enablement to walk in it. If you are yet to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, open your heart to the Lord in all sincerity and let Him fill you up. When He comes, act in faith and let Him flow through you. If you are already baptized in the Holy Ghost, constantly stir Him up in you. Ephesians 5.18 And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Jude 20. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Pray the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Holy Spirit to guide you, to be with you. Because he's, he, he's, a free, he's a gift from Jesus to us. Because as you can see in the start of the chapter, Jesus himself was, tempt, was tempted. Like us, we are constantly tempted, you know. So, in that's that's why we really need to to one, you know, to first in the name of Jesus cast out the evil spirit that is uh, destroying, you know, our lives. The the creating chaos and enemies, you know. And so, if we're f f are filled with the Holy Spirit, He would give us the gifts that we need. And of course, you, if you keep on asking for it, then He will give you. Because they, will, they all want us to, to go to heaven. So in, in, in this so in that manner, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we would easily uh, love, be able to love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind. Uh, we won't be, you know, uh, hesitating because He is with the Holy Spirit is with you, and so it will be easier. And, and his voice will be louder, you know. We just have to listen and obey. Because sometimes it's hard. It says, Jesus is ever faithful, resisting the temptations to abandon his father's mission. Because he is all powerful, he can order his angels to protect and guide you, guide us. So here we have to read. If we trust the Lord, then we should keep calm. You know, uh, don't panic. You know, don't don't hesitate because they will guide us. 
and here the picture that Jesus was healing uh, sick people uh, during that time. Actually, it is true this, uh, when I was younger, this is the, you know, the, the story that, that inspired me to become a doctor. That uh, he, he's a great physician. He's a healer. It says here in one article that uh, there are three types of people, and one is the natural person who's self-directed. The other, way, and second, the spiritual person, it's Christ-directed. And number three is the carnal direct uh, person, it's self-directed. In this another article says there are seven evidences of a spirit-filled life. It says here, there's a change in one's outlook. A believer has been born again, which is fundamental change of disposition and outlook. Walking in the flesh will mask this change. As we walk in the spirit, we become more aware of this life. It's a temporary pilgrimage and our true citizenship is in heaven. A desire to live for God's glory. The ultimate purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Jesus came to glorify the Father and we are told to glorify Him by our good works. So do, we, do you see a greater desire to glorify God? A desire to of greater knowledge of God. This happened to me when I com surrendered my life to God. Um, so around the mid eighties, when I was on duty in the hospital, and uh, after then, I got this hunger for to know the words, the Bible. A concern of lack of love of God, for God. The last point is convicting for all of us, but for those led by the Spirit, there will be a concern for our lack of love for Christ. And the self-righteous righteous person believes they love Christ like they should. A Spirit-led person realizes that we never could, yet there is a longing to increase in our love for Him. Next is, uh, it's an increased awareness of sin. The more you are led by the Spirit, the more there is an awareness of sin. This awareness will lead to, to mourning, confession, and repentance, thus drawing us closer to the Lord. There is different reaction to sin and the sensitivity to the temptation. As the Spirit works in us, there will be a more of a hunger and thinking for righteousness. The man who is being led steadily onwards by the Spirit has positive desires and yearnings and breathings after holiness and righteousness. fruit of the Spirit. Finally, one who is led by the Spirit is a manifesting, manifesting of the fruits of the Spirit. These characteristics are brought about by the Spirit and contrary to the natural man. As are you prideful, hateful, quick-tempered, harsh, and lacking in self-control? Do you see the Spirit bringing about change where you are weak? So, by, the, by God's grace, may we strive to be Spirit-led believers who display God's goodness and exalt His name in our lives. That's 
Romans 8 verse 5 to 17. So, study 10, the characteristic of a spirit life, filled life. Let us begin saying what the evidences are not. If a man is filled with the Holy Spirit, he will not necessarily be noisy, highly excited, or full of physical strength. The Spirit-led life, life is a life of calm posture and quiet confidence. To, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not much it is not to reach a state of sinless perfection or to attain a state where the old nature is eradicated the spirit led the you no know, the spirit filled life is not a life free from temptation a spirit filled life is not a life where further and fuller growth is impossible or unnecessary. The characteristics of the Spirit-filled life are seen in the life of our Lord. The characteristics of Spirit-filled life are seen in our Lord's teaching on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the characteristics of Spirit-filled life are seen in the lives of the apostles and early Christians. The characteristic of the spirit-filled life are seen in Galatians 5, 22-23. The characteristic of spirit-filled life are seen in Ephesians chapter 5, where we are commanded to be filled with the spirit. Our spiritual life is are seen by a study of the names and titles of the Holy Spirit. And that is uh, life, holiness, grace, truth, and power. And the seventh is that uh, the characteristic of spiritual life are seen by a study of the emblems of the Holy Spirit. Dove, indicating the beauty and gentleness of the Spirit. Seal, indicating the security of the Spirit's grace. The oil, indicating the Spirit's grace and the illumination of His teaching. Fire, indicating His work is of purification. Wind, indicating the searching nature of His power. Dew, Indicating of refreshing and test, test, no, fertilizing grace of His presence. Father, we believe in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We believe in your amazing love for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we recognize that we have a covenant with you. This new covenant was ratified by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Right now, we acknowledge that Jesus bore our sins, our sicknesses, diseases, sorrows, griefs, fears, torments, unforgiveness, strife, and lack for us. Everything on that cross. Yes, Lord, we believe that Jesus' body was broken for us. His precious blood was shed on our behalf. We praise and thank you for Jesus. Glory to your name. By Jesus' stripes, we are healed in every cell, in every organ, in every function of our body. Thanks to Jesus, our youth is renewed. With long life, you will satisfy us, Father. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we have total and complete redemption. We are totally delivered from the devil in every single way. We are new creations in Christ. Our freedom has been bought and paid for. Yes, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are free. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
This do in remembrance of me. We will eat now. Thank you, Father. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We take the cup in our hand and hold it up to you right now. Father, this represents the blood of the new covenant in which all our sins, past, present, and future, are all remitted. They are all forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Praise your holy name. Through his blood, we and our family are redeemed from every curse, every ancestral curse, from every single curse of the law. Thank you. We will drink now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a good, good God. You gave up your son to remove the barrier standing between you and us. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that above all else, you desire that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. We declare a new dimension of health, a new level of faith, a new realm of energy and divine strength. We declare that we are living, walking testimonies to all those around us who are defeated in this world. We have victory and new life in Jesus. Oh, that the world would come to know you. Protect, preserve, bless, and reach every single person in our family and our friends. In the wonderful and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Just so sleepy. <laughs> but uh, I'm having fun, you know, uh, trying to, to be a testimony to the Lord. At least in my little way, in my this tiny room, I could do it. So, good night. God bless us all. See you again tomorrow.